Good morning, good morning. Happy Easter to you. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's all stand together, sing a little bit, and then we'll move around and welcome each other. Because he lives. God sent his son. They call him Jesus. He came to die. Move around and wish somebody a happy Easter. He is risen. so thankful that we serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives salvation to impart. <laughs> you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Father, we're so thankful today for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the hope that it gives us, the assurance that it brings us. And we thank you for each person that's here, God, each family that's represented, and pray that they'll just be blessed. They'll be moved. They'll be drawn closer to you through the music this morning. And whatever else happens throughout their day as people worship in different places and families do different things together, we just pray that in the midst of it all, we'll remember that there is hope because Jesus is risen and he's defeated death, which Paul reminds us is the last enemy. When he died on the cross, that was the day death died. When he rose from the grave, that was the day life lived. So we thank you, Father. We praise you. We can never thank you enough. We can never praise you enough. You're just so good. God, you are just so good to us. And we just bow before you this beautiful Easter morning and just thank you for being so good, so great, so loving, so merciful, so kind, so forgiving. Everything we need most desperately, you and you alone provide for us most abundantly. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Have a seat. Pray. And um, some songs you'll recognize and some you won't. <laughs> Because some we do different ways. But if you'd like to sing along, join in. If you'd like to applaud or whatever, that's up to you. We appreciate any participation. It's not a performance.
because we are not professionals. Amen. It's just a concert for some people that love Jesus because of what he's done. So just relax if you're visiting with us. Don't feel like a visitor. We'll begin with a song that bridges Good Friday to Easter Sunday. A song from 1978. A group called Bethlehem, if you remember that back in the day. Who is this man? in a robe of purple a crown of thorns upon his head the judge stood him before them and he said behold the man On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. 
they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified in the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Who is this man? Jesus, my Savior, awaiting the coming day. Jesus, my
That he arose. <laughs> Searching for that crazy missing part And with one touch You just rolled away The stone that held my heart And now I see that the answer Was as easy as just asking you in And I'm so sure I could never find Your gentle touch again It's like the power of the wind
I know it stuns us too. <laughs> Mrs. Robinson is going to sing a beautiful song called Love Crucified Rose. Matt. <laughs> July. you all for that. If you have a Bible, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 24 for just a minute or two. If not, maybe you can look off somebody and look over their shoulder. Thank you, Luke. The 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke on this Resurrection Sunday. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, 
Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher, and stooping down he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs, or about seven miles. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these you have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered and said, Are you only a stranger in Jerusalem and don't know the things that have come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. For over 30 years, long about September the 29th, my wife and I would go on a trip for our anniversary, usually that last week of September or the first week of October, depending on how schedules went. Usually it was a long trip, maybe it would be a week down to her favorite spot, St. George Island, Florida. We'd rent a beach house. She loved the beach and I loved her. Somebody had to drive. So we would, we would go to the beach for a week. Uh, sometimes it was closer. We'd go to a bed and breakfast inn down in Paducah or over Evansville, Indiana. She loved bed and breakfast inns, and I loved her, so we'd go to a place like that. Uh, and last year, this time, one year ago, I had made reservations for us to go to Hawaii for our 35th wedding anniversary. And, of course, as you know, she got sick and had to cancel those plans, and... Um, when I preached her funeral here, I said, you know, she's in a better place than Hawaii. Heaven is like Hawaii without the bugs. <laughs> and I got to thinking the last trip that we took together, uh, we went to Branson. Now, we didn't go to Branson because we wanted to go to Branson. We went to Branson to the RFD TV theater to see Marty Stewart and his fabulous superlatives. Uh, we like to watch Marty Stewart on Saturday night on RFD TV. My wife liked that rockabilly stuff, thrown in with a little bluegrass and some gospel stuff. And a couple years ago, I had bought her this big book that they offered on TV. It had all Marty Stewart's pictures. He started playing on the road when he was 13 years old. He was a, a mandolin phenom. And so he had taken all these pictures down through the years of places where he had been and the stars that he'd been with and and. Uh, some of the side men, instrumentalists that nobody would knew, the cars they drove, different places they'd seen, even their rhinestone suits. He had just full of pictures like that. Had a big old picture. It was the last picture of Johnny Cash on the front. You may have seen that book if you ever watched Marty Stewart. Well, I had bought that book for my wife, and she wanted to take that book, and she did take that book, and Marty and all the superlatives signed that book for her, and she was really happy about that. Inside that book, there are a lot of quaint, curious things. One of them that grabbed my attention the first time I saw it was a, a, a homemade sort of mural plaque picture hanging thing that was on the wall of Gene Autry, the king of the cowboys. 
A guy named Woody Guthrie, whom you may remember, a folk singer, a political activist, best known for writing the song, This Land is Your Land. You remember? This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York. You, know, you remember that song. But, and he wrote a lot of other songs, too. But Woody Guthrie had made this sort of homemade-looking mural thing and given it to Gene Autry, and Gene Autry hung it on the wall of his house. And here's what it said. It said, man is nothing but an everlasting hoping machine. Man is nothing but an everlasting hoping machine. We need hope. Somebody said you can live a few weeks without food and a few days without water and a few seconds without air, but no time at all without hope. Hope. That's what they needed in this passage that they didn't have, that they were looking for, was, was hope. It was Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, who said, to live without hope is to cease to live. To live without hope is to cease to live. And I'm reminded of the story I tell a lot of times at funerals, the true story of the S-1, the submarine S-1. The year was 1927, and the submarine was just off the coast of Northampton, Massachusetts, and it was about to surface when it was hit by the Coast Guard cutter Paulding, and it sunk down to the bottom of the icy December waters. And there was a crew down in there waiting for someone to come and rescue them. But back then, the waters were icy. The rescue efforts were different than they were today. Everything was crude and antiquated. And they realized very quickly that they probably weren't going to be rescued. And as the story goes, the divers were hovering around this, this shell on the bottom of the ocean, and they heard a tapping, a tapping, a tapping sound. And as they got closer and as their ears became acclimated to the, the rushing and the thrushing of the waters, they realized that the men inside were tapping out a message in Morse code. And the message was a question. And the question was, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been like these guys were. Maybe you've been at the bottom. Maybe you've been down in the dark. Tapping, 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 praying, 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 asking, seeking, knocking, saying to somebody somewhere, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Maybe you've been as low as a snake's belly or lower at some point in your life. Now, today you may have the world by the tail. I don't know. But there may have been a time and there may be a future time when you ask that question, is there any hope? Rick Warren is a sort of a famous preacher. He left seminary in 1980 in Texas and went out to Southern California in an area called Saddleback, and he began Saddleback Community Church. Now it's a huge church, thousands and thousands of members. He wrote that book, The Purpose Driven Life. You may have read that years ago. It was sort of making the circuit. I never did read it, but it sounded like a good read. I never did read it, but a lot of people did, and it was helpful. And two years ago, Rick's 27-year-old son committed suicide. He'd had a life of depression and mental illness. They had tried doctors. They had prayed. They had done medicine. And one night, in just a fit of loneliness and lowness, this young man took his life. His father, Rick, pastor of a very large, influential, and successful church, his mother, Kay, they were devastated, as you can imagine. And they had to take a sabbatical to try to recover from what had happened. And when they came back to Saddleback Church, Rick preached his sermon, and Kay sat beside him on the podium. And he gave these three points that I wanted to share with you. You may want to write these down. He said, life doesn't make sense, but we can have peace because God loves us. Life doesn't make sense sense. But we can have peace because God loves us. That's the first thing he said the first time he preached after his son took his own life. The second thing he said was this, everything on earth is broken, but we can have joy because we know God has a better plan. 
everything on earth is broken. But we can have joy because we know God has a better plan. And then the third thing he said leads us into this text. He said, life is a battle. But we can have hope because we know there's more to the story. Life is a battle, but we can have hope because we know there's more to the story. It's all about hope. Easter is about many things, theological, cultural, personal. On a theological level, it's about a man who died on a cross for our sins. He paid fully, finally, for all of our sins, past, present, future, and not our sins only, but the Bible says the sins of the whole world. When Jesus was on the cross, he said seven things, and one time he said, it's finished. (laughs) It's done. And so Jesus Christ fully, finally paid for our sins on the cross, and then he rose from the grave on the third day to prove that it was true. That's what the resurrection is all about. And so Easter, theologically, is about what God has done for us. Religion is about us trying to get ourselves right with God. But Christianity says that God made us right through His Son. That's what it's all about. So there's theological implications to Easter. Deep things, justification and sanctification and propitiation and all all those other Asians that the scholars talk about. Words that usually go over our head and definitely miss our hearts. Then there's the cultural Easter. You know, there's chocolate bunnies and marshmallow peeps and Easter egg hunts with plastic eggs that jiggle with change when little children shake them and boys and girls dressed up in their Sunday best and spiral ham and relatives who come and stay way too long. (laughs) There's a cultural aspect to Easter where families get together, even today with broken families and blended families and the bonding of families. And we do Easter on this day and Easter on this day and Easter on this day, just trying to get everybody together because there's something about that that we feel deep down inside that's important, even with the the brokenness of families today. So there's a theological aspect to Easter. It's in the Bible. It's about what God has done. There's a cultural aspect. We we celebrate it in different ways and in different venues. But on a personal level, Easter is about hope. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, Easter hope. There's more to the story. No matter how dark it may look in your life today, No matter how quiet it may seem God is when you cry out to Him and nothing comes back. The fact that you don't have all your T's crossed and you don't have all your I's dotted and there's parts of your life that's just tangles and tangles and you can't seem to get the ends to meet. The fact that today your heart is broken or you're hurting or you're wounded or you just don't know why. Easter is about hope. The fact that in spite of all that, there's a God on the throne who loves you. And he says there's more to the story. You know, when my wife died five months ago, I thought I would go to the cemetery a lot. I'm one of those kind of guys that walks around in cemeteries and talks to people that's not there. (laughs) Not in a morbid way. But, you know, this sort of my, my thing. But, you know, I haven't been there very much, maybe four times. And once was just to make sure everything was in order. I'll have to go back in a couple of weeks and throw some dirt on the hole. They seem to settle. And uh, one day I went there just to sort of check things out. And um, over here at the Cudgetown Cemetery. And I saw a little white piece of paper. It was down at the slab 
where the slab and the stone meet. And someone, it could have been someone from this church, it could have been somebody she worked with at Marshall Browning Hospital. Don't know who, but someone had taken one of these Sharpie black felt tip markers and on this little piece of paper they had written, we still miss you, exclamation point. I looked at that little piece of paper for a while and I thought, who does that? Why do we do things like that? Why do we go to cemeteries and talk to people who aren't there? Why do we take flowers and bunnies and little pieces of paper? Who goes out of their way to drive to the Cudgetown Cemetery and write that on a piece of paper and stick it? Why do we do that? Well, we hope. We hope. We hope. Man is nothing but an everlasting hoping machine. Why are you here? You hope. Why are there people in other churches of every denominational spot and stripe? <laughs> we hope. And they had lost hope here on that first resurrection morning. We want to hope. We, we want to believe. We want to hold on. We want to hang in. We believe there's more to the story. We believe there's more than this. And we hope. Have you ever thought that hope is at the same time the most powerful and the most pitiful thing in the world? Hope is at the same time the most powerful and the most pitiful thing in the world. This was illustrated to me vividly a few weeks ago. I was reading an article. I was in a hospital. I spent a lot of times in hospitals, and I just pick up a magazine or a newspaper. And I was reading this magazine. I don't even remember if it was time. It was Newsweek or Woman's Day or Cosmopolitan or whatever you do what it was. <laughs> don't read Cosmo, by the way. But anyway, and it was this story, this fantastic story about this woman. She was a school teacher from Iowa. Her name was Susan. And Susan had become pregnant as a senior in high school. The guy didn't want to have anything to do with her. He ran off and did his thing. And so she decided to raise the baby. Her parents kicked her out. It was a long story. And she sacrificed much. And after the child got into school, the daughter, Jenny, she went back to school, the mother, and she got, it, got her master's degree and became a school teacher in Iowa. And then sadly, as the story went, Jenny, the daughter, when she turned 15, she told her mother she hated her. She was tired of her mother running her life, and she left. She ran away. Said she was going out west, going to go do her own thing, live her own life. Well, it broke Susan's heart, as you can imagine. She'd stayed away from men for 15 years to raise her daughter, sacrificed everything to try to set a good example for her, and now she had turned tail, tucked tail, and run. Sometimes our kids turn out weird. We do the very best we can with them, and they do something stupid. They do something crazy. They do something weird. We always love them, but why do they get so weird on us? I don't know, but we have hope. We never lose hope, and she didn't either. She realized over two or three years that if she was ever going to see her daughter, she was going to have to go find her. She quit her job. She sold her house. She lived in her car. She drove to the West Coast for the picture. From Seattle to San Diego, stopping places. Have you seen her? This is my daughter, Jenny. She was 14 when she left. This was three years ago. She still probably looks like this. Have you seen her? This is my daughter. I'm trying to find her. Have you seen her? All the way up and down she goes living in her car, looking for her daughter. Sometimes people will say, why don't you go home, woman? She's probably dead or she's hiding from you. Why don't you just give up? And yet she goes to the next place. It's a truck stop. It's an apartment complex. It's low-rent housing. It's a hotel. 
where nobody would stay on purpose. And she walks in and she says to the clerk, this is my daughter. This is Jenny. Have you seen her? I love her. I miss her. Why does she do that? She hopes. So powerful. So pitiful. She hopes. She hopes. And big tears formed in my eyes as I was reading this article in the hospital. And the article ended with this phrase, Susan, at the time of this writing, has still not found Jenny, but she's still looking. Why do people do that? It's hope. She hopes. She hopes. We hope. We want to believe that there's more to the story. We want to believe that there's a place where tears are wiped away and broken hearts are mended and people love each other and runaway girls come home. We want to believe. We want to believe. We want to believe. We hope. We hope. We hope. And that's what this story is all about. Easter's theological and Easter's cultural, but at the personal level, at the gut level, at the grassroots level, where the water meets the wheel, where the rubber meets the road, Easter's about hope. Notice two things in this passage, and I'll stop my sniveling and we'll go someplace else. <laughs> Notice, first of all, what they felt. I just... In orange, I just highlighted some words here. And you follow along with me if you can in whatever version you're reading. Verse 4 says, It came to pass as they were much perplexed. They were confused. They were perplexed, much perplexed. They were wondering, verse uh, 12 tells us Peter was wondering in himself, what's going on? What's this all about? We look back like it's some kind of movie that we already know the ending to, and they were just moving forward trying to figure it all out. What's going on? And see, in your life and my life, it's like that. We don't have it all figured out. We're moving through it like they were at this time. They were perplexed like we can be. They were confused. They wondered. Verse 11 says they were filled with unbelief. Hadn't they walked with Jesus three years? Hadn't they heard the parables? Hadn't they seen the miracles? And yet they couldn't believe. Hadn't he said over and over again, I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to rise the third day. They just couldn't believe it. It was just beyond their belief. Verse 5 says they were afraid. They were filled with fear. And sometimes we're afraid. We're filled with fear. Things happen that shock us, that rock us. The jagged edges of life end in death, and we're cut to pieces wondering, how do we go on? Where do we go from here? How do we believe? How do we live? How do we hope? That's where they were. They were sad. Jesus, verse 17, said, why are you talking like this and walking like this and are sad? Sadness, despair. Discouraged, depressed, down. And then in verse 21, they were hopeless. Notice they talk in the past tense. People who are losing hope always talk in the past tense. They always look over their shoulder. They're always driving with their eyes on the rearview mirror. We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. Past tense. They were hopeless. We thought he was the one. It's like if you went to the racetrack, and I don't know if any of you bet on a racetrack, don't do that, but you put all your money on one horse, and he lost. They, they had placed all of their faith, all of their trust, all of their hope, in this Jesus guy. And at this point, they thought all they had was a dead Jew on a tree. Because he's dead. What are you going to do with dead? How are you going to get life out of dead? 
he's dead. We trusted that he was the one. And so they felt all these feelings that we feel when we face death, when we deal with the fact that, you know, I got fired from my job or I came home and she left me the letter, you know, uh, we're going to divorce or, or, or whatever the situation is, that sinking feeling when that thing happens, when the doctor calls and says, hey, it's cancer, you know, whatever. We go through these emotions and we lose hope. And so we need hope. That's what they felt. If you're feeling that today, I know you're dressed up and you look good, but deep down inside, maybe you're feeling those types of feelings today. You see what they felt, but don't miss what they found. Verse 21, we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day. <laughs> The third day, 14 or 15 times that phrase is used in the Gospels, and it speaks of the day that Jesus predicted, the day he said he would rise from the grave. The third day, that's where the hope comes from. They found an empty tomb. They found a risen Savior. They found a reason to go on. They found hope. You see, ultimately, my brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we only have two options in this life. Only two choices. And God loves you, and he gives you and me the autonomy of personhood, the dignity of choice. You can choose to be hopeless, or you can choose hope. You can choose to be hopeless, or you can choose hope. I've made my choice. Father, as we come to this time, of concluding our time together this Easter Sunday morning. I pray if there is someone here today, those that have not chosen hope, they've not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they would do that today. Lord, there may be others here that know you. They were like these walking on the road that first Easter morning, sad, confused, questioning, hopeless. It seemed pointless to go on. And yet Jesus came alongside, if we continue the story, shared with them what they already knew from the scriptures that he was the one who should come, who should suffer, who should die and rise again. He shared the theological with them. They already knew all that. The academic, the pedantic, the intellectual. It was in their heads. But when Jesus showed up, it got down in their hearts. And they were changed forever. And two guys that were walking all shuffle-footed and slumped over for seven miles ran all the way back to Jerusalem, seven miles, to tell the disciples, Jesus is risen. He's alive. He is the one. We did have it right. And Lord, we need that today. The hope of Easter. The hope that goes beyond the grave. The hope that wipes away all tears. The hope that heals every broken heart. The hope so powerful. I pray, Lord Jesus, each one of us here today has that hope, has that hope that you died on the cross and rose from the grave to make available to anyone who chooses it. Father, I pray you remind each person here one more time that there are only two options. We choose to hope or we become hopeless. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean we don't struggle. It doesn't mean our children don't run away. Our sons don't take their own lives. Our wives, who a year ago were healthy, walking around the St. Louis Zoo, holding hands with a little four-year-old boy, are now in heaven. We have no guarantees in this life. 
But when this life is over, we have the guarantee of heaven through Jesus Christ. And as we move that direction, we have hope every step of the way. And we thank you for it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ruby, what number? 406 is going to be our hymn of invitation, decision. If you take a hymn, they'll turn to 406. And if God is calling you as you stand, as we sing, you can come. You can receive Christ. You can return to him. You can have the hope that only Jesus brings. That's what Easter is all about. It's all about hope. You come as we sing, if God is calling you. you put your books down and move across and take somebody by the hand. If you're visiting with us, don't feel uncomfortable. We do this with great regularity here. And if you're visiting, you can come back next time. We'd love to have you. Uh, there'll be no activities tonight. Everybody be going to family stuff. Everybody's coming to my house and our family, and that's going to be fun. And uh, you enjoy your family and your time together. But you can call me if you want to talk about things, you know, know more about the Lord, know about the church. And you'd be more than welcome to come back. It'd be great to have this many people the Sunday after Easter. But I know some of your family and you got other places to go. But you'd be welcome. We'd love to have you. There's some books out there if you haven't picked one up. Our guys are handing them out. You may want to take one and give to somebody this week. Be a blessing to them. A little devotional book about Easter and really about hope. Don't you all forget, Easter is about a lot of things, but Easter is ultimately about hope. That's what it's all about. Father, we bow before you, acknowledging that you're God, that you're on the throne. When we say that, we always don't know what that means. When we submit our lives to you and surrender our time to you, sometimes you allow things into our lives that we would have never scheduled that we would have never planned. But we know, as Paul said, you're working all things together for our good. And all things aren't good, but you're working things together for our good. And so, Father, we just submit to you on this Easter Sunday, afresh and anew, and pray that whatever you want to do, you go on ahead because we know you know best. Even when we don't fully understand or can't figure it out, even when it causes us to be perplexed and brokenhearted, hopeless, despairing. We believe beyond belief. I think about what Abraham, Paul said about Abraham. He hoped against hope. How do you do that? Well, we've done it. I'm doing it right now. We hope against hope. People say, it'll never work out. That'll never happen. But we hope. We're a people of hope. We're everlasting hoping machines because we know the other alternative is hopelessness, and we don't want that. We don't want to live there. We don't want to stay there. We don't want to get stuck there. So God, stir us up with hope. The hope that we need to keep our heads up, to keep our hearts full, to keep our steps straight until we see you face to face. Pray now for the person to my right, the person to my left, a valuable, wonderful, precious person created by you and redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ, a person of inestimable worth, 
a person you loved so much that you sent your only begotten son to the cross, a person your son loved so much that he laid down his life willingly so that they could go to heaven and have hope every step of the way. I pray for this person to my right, this person to my left, that you would bless them, that you would bless them, that you would just bless them. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Probably most everybody knows most everybody up here, but uh, I'll introduce everybody in the group and please hold your ravenous applause to the end. No, just kidding. Over here on the right is my little brother. One of my two little brothers. I got two little brothers. One of them sitting over there, I think. There he is. He got the donuts ready this morning. So he was here. He and Darby made the donuts. But this is my brother, Matt Mathis. And he's, uh, go ahead, give it to him. Back here on the piano, electric piano, is my nephew. He's actually the youngest son of my middle brother. I was sitting over the one that did the donuts. He's Donut Jr. <laughs> That's Sam, Sam Mathis. Over here to my left is my brother Bob. No, he's not my brother in that sense, but he is in the sense he's my Christian brother. And Bob Free plays bass with us, and we appreciate Bob very much. Love you, Bob. <laughs> right up here in the uh, Robin Egg blue shirt. Hope I, don't hatch. <laughs> I hope you don't hatch either. If you hatch, we got a whole lot of scrambled eggs to eat, brother. <laughs> this is uh, Todd Rushing. Todd's my first cousin. We're the same age, born five days apart, went all the way through school together and played ball together, and now we get to serve the Lord together, and it's awesome, and I love you. Love you, Todd Rushing. <laughs> Here in the middle adorning us is Chrissy Robinson. Mrs. Robinson has been singing with us for a while. And um, she teaches English and literature up at Nashville High School, and we appreciate her very much. And her two boys will get baptized later on this morning, so she's really happy this morning. <laughs> Chrissy Robinson. And the newest member of our group over here is Miss Allison Stevenson. She's sung and played piano a lot of places and been with groups. And maybe some of you have seen her somewhere, and we're just so thankful that she was willing to lend her incredible talents to our group for God, and so Miss Allison Stevenson. <laughs> what happened that first morning from uh, three separate perspectives, the perspective of Joseph, the perspective of Nicodemus, and the perspective of Mary. It's called We Buried the Messiah. <laughs> We took down his body broken as the sun was swiftly sinking and carried him to Joseph's family too. Not a single word was spoken, but I remember thinking, what a shame, his life had ended much too soon. So without much preparation and a sense of resignation, we quickly finished doing what God done. And we walked back to Jerusalem, surrounded by the twilight and the sadness of a story half begun. We buried the Messiah. Life would never be the same. We listened to his parables. Witness many miracles, faithfully believed in Jesus' name. But we heard him say, it's finished. And I saw him hang his head. Oh, we buried the Messiah. Now all our hopes are dead. I watched Nicodemus and Joseph.
questions I saw a man and asked him what he knew We buried the Messiah Life would never be the same Can you tell me where they laid him? Don't you know how much I love him? When suddenly the master spoke my name from the dead we buried the messiah but he's risen from the dead That's a life worth living for. We buried the Messiah, but he lives forevermore. We buried the what this song is all about. to 
At the tomb that day To shuffling soldiers' feet As they guarded the grave One day, two days Three days had passed Could it be that Jesus Had breathed his last Could it be that his father had forsaken him, turned his back on his son, despising our sin. All hell seemed to whisper, just forget him, he's dead. Then the father looked down to his son, and he said, So loud and so clear. 
my Lord. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to that tree? Were you there when they nailed him to that tree? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to that tree? Oh, were you there when they laid him in that tomb? Were you there when they laid him in that tomb? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in that tomb? Oh, were you there when he rose up from the grave? Were you there when he rose up from that grave? Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Oh, were you there when he rose up from that grave? He arose, he arose. Christ the Lord. We were all there, the Bible says. It wasn't actually the Roman soldiers or the Jewish leaders that crucified Jesus. We all had a part in it. Our sins, of course, nailing to the cross. So we identify with him through repentance, faith, belief. And then our life, Paul tells us, is hid with Christ in God. Jesus said, because I live, you live also. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the sound of a trumpet and the dead in Christ rising first. And we who are alive will be caught up and gathered together with them in the air. It's going to be quite a thing. The rapture, the gathering together, the calling up. It's next on the list. And that's what this funky song's all about. have wandered in the darkness for a long, long time, trying to find our way. 
We have squandered many blessings all along the line. Day after day after day. But don't allow your past to dominate. Or the future to manipulate. Just believe him in the here and now. He is here and he will show you how. We will rise. We will Sacrifice to idols in our hearts and minds. Just trying to find our place. Been enticed by a worldly pleasure that has robbed us blind and made us hide our face. I understand why you would hesitate, but take his hand and let him elevate. Just believe him in the here and now. He is here and he will show you how we will rise. Don't you worry about tomorrow. God's train is running right on time. Keep believing in his promises forever. We will rise. Yes, we will. Oh, yes, we will. We will rise. When we hear that trumpet. children Don't you worry about tomorrow. God's train is running right on time. Keep believing in his promises forever. We will rise. Yes, we will. Oh, yes, we will. We will rise. When you hear that trumpet. crown of thorns placed on his head he knew that he would soon be dead he said did you forget me father did you they nailed him to a wooden cross soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ the King before
He hung his head and prepared to die, then lifted his face to the sky, said, I am coming home now, Father, to you. A reed which held his final sip was gently lifted to his lips. He drank his last and gave his soul to glory. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. The soldier who had used the sword to pierce the body of the Lord said truly this is Jesus Christ our Savior he looked with fear upon his sword then turned to face his Christ Lord fell to his knees crying hallelujah hallelujah Took from his head the thorny crown and wrapped him in a linen gown and laid him down to rest inside the tomb. The holes in his hands, his feet, his side, now he went by again they came to move the stone to bless the slain with oil and spice anointing hallelujah but as they went to move the stone they saw stand together, time of worship here at the end, a couple of songs, and then you're invited into the back for our donuts. If you didn't get one of our little booklets, take one with you or take one for somebody else. If you're coming back later on today, they'll be available then as well too. Let's just worship the Lord a little bit because he's risen. Because he's risen, he's worthy. Oh, it's the, 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 the,
treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind the stone, made to die, rejected. Well, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Oh, oh soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see
the songs we can sing, the joy we can feel, the peace that we can know, the hope that we can have. <laughs> we got it all when we got you, when you got us, when we got it. <laughs> and we're so thankful today that our sins are forgiven, forgotten forever under the blood of Jesus Christ, and now we get to live. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and live it up. So help us to do that. Help us to rejoice in the salvation that we have and love one another and share the love of Jesus with everybody we can, as much as we can, as often as we can, knowing that soon and very soon we're going to go see the king. And so we're thankful for that. Father, we're so thankful for the time we've had together this morning. Bless our time around breakfast, Sunday school, church, the rest of the day. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. God bless you right through here if you're staying for the breakfast. God bless you.